Yeah, I, we'd now like to move on to the panel discussion. Thank you so much for those fantastic talks and hopefully we'll have a chance to come back to some of the speakers during our panel discussion. We're running slightly late, but we've still got a good 40 minutes to discuss. Um, and Fabian Zulim, who you've already had introduced, and I are co-chairing the panel discussion. I'm Marla Maney from London. Hi, everybody. Um, so what I want to do is just first introduce each of our panelists. Um, we've got a, a fantastic team of people who've agreed to join the panel to discuss um, the clinical relevance of these different biomarkers. And I'll just um, briefly introduce each one and ask them to just say a couple of sentences about what they think are the key um, biomarkers that they'd like to see more attention on and more research on. Um, so just let's start um, first with Jenny Yang. So Jenny Yang is the Senior Director of Clinical Research at Gilead Sciences, um, who's now leading the HPV um, cure program, clinical program there at Gilead. So Jenny, um, can we start by having your thoughts on what you've heard today and what you think are the most important clinically relevant biomarkers that we have at present and, and what further work needs to be done on them? Yes, thank you, Mala. Um, you know, for, from my perspective, I think we're really fortunate to have, you know, some really good markers in terms of HBV DNA surface antigen um, that's been linked to long-term clinical outcomes for us to evaluate as, you know, to define functional cure in our clinical programs. I think where we uh, need more data is on the newer assays in terms of RNA as well as correlated antigen when it comes to understanding the impacts on long-term clinical outcome. So those are areas I feel that you know, would be good to have a larger data set in order to understand um, the implications of these declines that we see. Um, other areas that you know, I, from today's talk that you know, I think would be really nice to have a larger database to assess is also in HCC, especially in early detection. Um, you know, that those would be really helpful in terms of understanding um, patient progression, especially since our clinical trials are much shorter than a long-term clinical outcome studies. So having an understanding of what those markers mean uh, would be useful. Lovely, thank you. That's a lovely summary to start us off. Um, so next on our panel, we have Bill Delaney, who um, just recently joined Assembly Biosciences as Chief Scientific Officer of Virology there in May this year. Previously, he was for 20 years at Gilead, um, leading the um, therapeutic research on HPV there. So Bill, thanks for joining us. Um, can you just share a few comments on the same uh, sort of summary topic that Jenny just did? Hi, thanks, Mala. Can you hear me? That's good, thanks. Okay, great. Yeah, so I, I agree a lot with what uh, Jenny just said. Uh, you know, we're fortunate to have uh, the mar markers that we have uh, with, with, with DNA, and I think there's, there's a couple of emerging markers that are really exciting, uh, particularly um, RNA, viral RNA. So learning more about that as we move forward, um, as we generate more clinical data and correlate that with long-term outcomes in, in patients. I think there's some really exciting data that's coming out there. Um, correlated antigen as well. I, I think one, one key area that would be a great improvement would be, you know, more direct um, knowledge of what was coming from CCC DNA versus integrated forms of, of HPV, particularly in HBS. So, so maybe the different isoforms of S or if we can find some other ways to differentiate um, the source of, of, of surface antigen uh, would be greatly needed. And then, and then I think um, beyond the viral markers, what I look forward to is, is getting more into the immunology. And you know, if we, if we knew we were moving the patient uh, closer to the immune response that we, 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 we wanted uh, to, to overcome the infection, and, and we could see that coming sooner than we can now, I think a lot of the markers you know, we, we see kind of when people seroconvert, we see the T cell responses, but if, if we could see that coming sooner and, and know that our treatment was taking us in the right direction, that, that, would, be a, that would be a huge help to, to all of us uh, trying to meet that goal of cure. You said the right thing, bringing in the immune, immune response. Well done. <laughs> okay, lovely. Um, moving on, I think, have we got Gavin Cloherty here? Who's, I think, should be with us. He's the head of infectious yeah. disease <laughs> for, for appetite. Um, so Gavin, Hi. welcome your comments. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, sorry, I'm not uh, available on video, but um, you know, I, I, I would uh, echo some of the comments that have been made already. I think it's very reassuring that we have uh, some excellent biomarkers in HPV DNA and surface antigen. I think there's been a lot of effort in some meta-analysis around surface antigen, and it's still kind of in a, in a way rain, reigning supreme as that clinical endpoint. I guess nothing predicts surface antigen loss like surface antigen loss. Um, I think in terms of the new uh, biomarkers, uh, I think while, while we explore um, their, their utility in different um, therapeutic regimens and different patient populations and stuff, m much of that uh, work is, is ongoing. I liked uh, some of the, com uh, the talk by Daryl Lau uh, because I think we need to keep in mind the implementation and the challenges around just accessing diagnostics in general and simplification of diagnostics in general because uh, if we've got some fantastic biomarkers but we can't get them to the people who need them, then the impact is going to be minimal. So uh, I think we just need to be cognizant of that as we move forward. Uh, but uh, I think there's a lot of great work going on, and I think the immunology side is going to be very interesting to see as the kind of uh, for, uh, area that, uh, for the future as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Anna Maria Garetti, um, who has a dual appointment as an expert scientist at Roche Farm in Switzerland. is also a professor, professor of virology and an ID um, consultant at the University of Liverpool. So Anna Maria, thanks for joining us. Are you there? Are you on mute? I think, Anna Maria, are you on mute? Okay, we, we can't hear Anna at the moment, so let's come back to her. We'll move on. So we've got Henry Chan, who's a, a very well-known um, researcher in HBV worldwide and is Professor of Medicine and Associate Dean the Faculty of Medicine at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Henry, thanks for joining Hi. us. Hi, thank you, Mala. Can you hear me? Well, I think yes, uh, for hepatitis B, uh, well, we were excited by HPSAGS 10 years ago because it gives extra information to any suppressed patients. And we start to understand that there's a lot of virus in the liver. But however, we are confused by the source of HPSAG from either CCC DNA or integrate HPV DNA. And it obviously is quite different in the post negative patients. And now we have HP chlorine antigen with HP RNA. Both of them may reflect the transcription activities of CCC DNA. However, we do not know what's the factors that governs the activities on top of the level of CCC DNA. So how to use these markers, we still need more data. And when we shall use RNA, when we shall use CRAG, and what is the overlap? Between these two markers, again, we need more data. In terms of XCC biomarker, this is always an MET need since we have our finger protein. And even we have a, a huge bench of new biomarkers, and um, uh, these are all, they have not reached the final stage of uh, validation. A lot of us have only seen improvement in, in AUROC, but how can this be translated in the clinical benefits? Still re require a lot of. Uh, investigation. So I think ultimately it will be good if we can have a panel biomarkers that can replace our ultrasonography. Then that will be the ultimate goal of the biomarker. Because otherwise if we still need ultrasound and there's only minimal benefits of adding one to two more biomarkers to the ultrasound, then one may doubt whether it's worth worthy to pay so much money to do a new biomarker assay. So I think this is, there's still a long way to go. Thank you. Can you just comment on, do you think there's any progress in um, HCC biomarkers that would guide us in terms of selection of therapies now that more therapies are becoming available uh, for HCC? Well, I think um, but one, one major use of the biomarker is to monitor treatment response as well as recurrence. But for those biomarkers to be useful, they must be elevated at time when the tumor develops. So uh, if we have a panel of biomarkers, because some uh, HCC or AFP negative, but on the other hand, they may be DCP positive or AFL free elevated, then sometimes these biomarkers can be used to monitor the response of tumor as well as, as recurrence. Because sometimes, say, after local regional therapy, um, a, 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 a mere imaging may not be, cannot uh, convincingly show 
whether the tumor has, has recurred or not. And sometimes it needs to reach a certain size before it can be evident on even dynamic imaging. But if the biomarker goes up, then it gives a, it may give a hint that um, the tumor may come back. So I think that this is one additional role of these biomarkers on top of uh, XCC screening. Okay, thank you. I think um, Anna Maria is now um, with us. Hi, um, Anna Maria. Can Sorry, you... I had some technical technical challenges. <laughs> Always at the at the right time. <laughs> Apologies for that. Can you just comment on? We're just talking about sort of our summary of of what you think the key areas are that that um, are looking most promising for clinically relevant biomarkers that you've heard about today, and which ones really need more work. I think that like for the uh, previous uh, week workshop, the message that is coming across quite uh, clearly is obviously twofold, right? The first is the need for integration so that we are looking at more than one biomarker of uh, CCC DNA expression being sort of the obviously the, 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 the key parameter here that we sort of are considering, uh, we want to avoid the need for uh, liver biopsies if possible. And I have a question in fact about that. Um, and, and the second point is, so how do we integrate the whole uh, or more than one marker, if not all of the markers, how do we bring that um, unified vision uh, of you know, using more than one biomarker? What studies do we need to do uh, we starting, you know, we, we, we have already seen some study highlighting, for instance, a combination of a surface antigen and, and heavy RNA uh, below a certain level and other similar studies. So, so what else is required to really develop that integrated, you know, approach uh, where we identify really what works? Uh, so that is one aspect. And the second aspect, which I think is coming across quite clearly, is the need for further refinement of the uh, essays we do have. We've heard a lot now about, you know, improved sensitivity of surface antigen, of DNA. The CRAG definitely needs to improve in its sensitivity. Mm, what about her BRNA? Have we done all the development that was possible? And again, I think that there, I would see that uh, there is a, a need for an integrated effort uh, to try and, you know, uh, define the work plan. So. What, what is required and how, you know, it, it, will it be beneficial to have a consensual approach at targeting those specific areas, uh, you know, defining the parameters, what is improved sensitivity of DNA, for example, where, you know, is it single copy DNA? Where, where is that, you know, we, we want to get to? So those are for me the two messages that really um, come across quite uh, clearly. Um, and, and, and the second is more perhaps uh, sort of, the, the, sorry, the third element is perhaps more uh, philosophical, which is around, you know, how will we then define a cure, functional or, or complete cure moving forward once, you know, we are able to integrate the various biological markers and potential immunological markers. And I've heard comments as to, well, mm, you know, maybe you don't need to lose the surface antigen or, and then at the other extreme, you need to prove that there is no CCC DNA. So I think that that is obviously work in progress for us as a, as a scientific um, community. Great, thank you. And so I have great. a question. If I can pose a question to the panel, <laughs> that would be good. So I, I would like to ask um, how much of this work uh, in terms of the detection of um, CCC DNA, for example, how much we think it could be done using uh, fine needle arm spirates rather than using liver biopsies. Uh, is there any scope? Um, I know that um, several groups have been working on this, and, uh, but I haven't heard it much. Um, and I'd like to pose this question. Is it, is it feasible for us to think that we may obviate the need uh, for a liver biopsy and use perhaps a serial fine needle arm spirates instead? Thank you, Anna Maria. So that's uh, some really interesting points about sensitivity, thresholds of assays, integrating information. And then we come back to your question in a second. Let's just finish with the last comments from our, our 
I think this is our final panel member. I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. Maria Beaumont is um, Senior Medical Director at Janssen um, in the role of Hepatitis uh, Franchise Medical. Maria, over there. Yes, uh, hi, Miranda. It's, uh, it's always hard to come last. It's always difficult to add something Sorry. interesting to everything was already already uh, said. But um, so personally, my, my areas where I would really like to see a bit more um, understanding is um, this um, concept of the different uh, S antigens forms and if we could differentiate between integrated versus CCC DNA derived as antigen to help us identify patients uh, that could possibly stop treatment uh, with a lower risk of relapse eventually. Um, I think that optimization of the current uh, biomarkers, it's going to be very important. I agree with Kevin that these uh, assays need to be widely available and well understood for monitoring of patients in the clinic. So um, anything that we can do with the newer biomarkers that can help us understand the biology of hepatitis B will be great. But in the end, we'll need to monitor the patients. And, uh, and so um, that bridge uh, at some point will need to be crossed. I think that, um, and we had a great talk on hepatocellular carcinoma and risks for hepatocellular carcinoma. I think it's going to be uh, very important to understand the, the different populations within the patients that successfully stop treatment. And, and there I joined Anna Maria saying that, that we, would, we might need to redefine different groups of patients that are able to, to stop treatment, function, cure, other kind of responses, because we might actually uh, be able to monitor those patients differently. Otherwise, you know, stopping treatment is going to be a great step forward, but how to differentiate from the patients that can really um, be reassured in terms of the response they achieve to hepatitis B and the others that are at continued risk of potentially having complications or or needing to restart therapy at some point. So lots to do, um, not only understanding biomarkers as we treat the patient, but also what they tell us once we stop. Thank you. So that's bringing up some extra issues to think about the patient groups and the, and the situation of um, treatment stop. Really, thank you so much, all of you, for your comments. So I think we, we should move on now to some discussion and questions. So maybe before I forget, we start with um, a handover to Fabien for that. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe, Fabien, do you want to start by answering Anna Maria's question about um, fine needle aspirates and CCC DNA? Well, uh, actually, um, um, I had... Um, um, I had actually uh, one or two questions that may, that are actually re related to that. Well, I mean, the um, the first one I, see, I don't remember who, who addressed that issue. That we uh, so, so at the first session and and and, to, and today's session, we we mainly focused on 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 viral biomarkers, and we we haven't. I mean, we have discussed a little bit on 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 immune immune uh, responses and. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, to, we, we will need to, to make sure that the, um, the, the HBV infection is still under immune control at some point when we stop treatment, whatever they are. So, so I, I wanted to ask you first what, what, you, what you think in terms of what are the priorities in terms of easy to use in the clinic uh, 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 as biomarkers or, or assays to... to uh, uh, to to um, you know to help evaluate uh, the new new treatments that are that are in in clinical trials. Ah, great, turning it back to me. Okay, I mean I think the reason why you know we, we've obviously not had much focus on immune responses in this particular workshop because of the title of serum rather than it was serum, and so I think everyone's even the one immune talk that we had was about serum markers, which are probably not, you know, they can be useful for some indirect measures of immunity, but the key for measuring immune responses will be cellular um, assays, which at the moment are pretty complex. Um, and so um, they need a lot more work, I think, than the viral biomarkers to get to the point where we can really think about them being useful um, is sort of large scale clinical trial monitoring. 
Um, and also in terms of understanding what those immune markers mean in terms of correlates of protection, uh, it's still quite complicated. Whereas with the viral markers, we can at least say, okay, we, you know, we know that we want to lose these viral biomarkers and not be able to detect them. And if we can't detect them, you could argue we don't need the immune markers on top of that if we really have a great result. But if it's in the cases where we have a suboptimal result and we still need to sort of further develop the drugs, that then I think um, sort of early stages of those trials, intensive um, immunological assays are really important. But those are not really at the stage of being biomarkers. I think they're more sort of exploratory assays because they need, you know, looking at virus specific T cells, maybe S antigen um, specific B cells, um, you know, sort of complex assays that are needing still to be done by research labs. Maybe, you know, they could move towards some sort of um, uh, diagnostic immune assay in the same way that we do have these assays, for example, for TB, which look at T cell responses with interferon gamma. And maybe mm -hmm. we could move towards that eventually, but we're, we're quite a long way from that still at the moment in HPV. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mala. So, so ju just to, uh, I didn't try to ex to escape the F question. <laughs> to, um, so, so back to, to FNA, it's uh, it's a really uh, uh, important question. We 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 really know, um, uh, what is going on I in the infected organ. Um, so the um, b both in terms of, of viral persistence, but also Im immune responses, immune restoration. Uh, so FNA, um, I think, needs to be e explored and we need to continue the exploration, that the investigation that are being, uh, that have been initiated by several groups. Um, uh, and, and this can be used, um, I believe, in uh, uh, not only in the understanding of, of the uh, 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 of the disease and, and, and the new treatment concept, but the kind of proof of concept clinical trials where, where uh, some companies are, are, are trying to really push for, for the cure, uh, and which is really good. I mean, uh, at some point we need to stop treatment. So not knowing what is in the liver reservoir in terms of immune responses and, 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 and viral markers, would be very important to um, to understand the outcome after treatment cessation. So, so, it, so um, I think we need to, to continue the, this this inf investigation. This may also be very important to validate biomarkers because biomarkers are, are, are developed, and we have seen very interesting presentations, and and we've seen that the we need to 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 make correlations between the uh, uh, findings in, in the uh, blood circulation and within the liver, so it could be within on liver biopsy samples, but also on, on, on the uh, liver samples from animals. Um, so I think the liver compartment should still be still be analyzed uh, m more in terms of uh, detailed investigation. But then I would like to ask the um, uh, our, our colleagues from the industry. Uh, how they would um, see um, uh, FNA studies uh, within uh, a proof of concept clinical trials or, or sub, sub studies within a trial. So I think that would be interesting to have their opinion. So I don't know, we can start with, with can go around the, with the same uh, order. We can start with Jenny, maybe. Yes, um, thank you, Fabian. I you know, I, I think FNAs, we're, we're also, in you know, still trying to understand, by far I'm not an expert uh, in this area, but, um, you know, for us, I, I think it's important um, to understand what we can evaluate using FNAs for, and, you know, from a lot of the great talks that we've heard, um, both at the HPV Forum recently, as well as um, the last talks, you know, it sounds like what we can really evaluate is mostly more immune markers um, in the liver and immune changes. Um, but, you know, I think it's the limits really kind of understanding 
the hepatocytes within the FNAs. And I, I think understanding, you know, how it correlates um, with um, actual, you know, the gold standard liver biopsies and what we're seeing there is really important before we, you know, can really interpret the data from FNAs. So we are doing a lot of pilot studies, um, you know, to try to understand this because it is a way for us to see what is happening in the liver microenvironment um, that patients are much more willing to participate with um, than obviously consenting to a liver biopsy at this time. Okay, so, thank you, Jenny. So, uh, um, uh, Bill, what, what, what would be your view on, on, on FNA in, in the clinical development process? Yeah, uh, Fabian, I, I, think it's, I think it's very promising. Um, you know, one, I think one overarching concern we have is how, how well does the serum reflect what's going on in the liver? And, if it, you know, I think the advantage of FNA is that it, 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 you may be able to get many more patients in, in, enrolled in this type of study. It might be just a more accessible material. So I think it's really the question is now how, how do we make best use of the material that can come from the FNA using the most sensitive techniques, whether it's sequencing or nucleic acid detection. But, you know, um, as Jenny said, I think getting, you know, although there's relatively few hepatocytes in, in, in these FNA, you know, it may be enough to, to, to allow us at least a, 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 you know, some picture of what's happening in, in the liver. So, so, I, so I think that's important. I mean, it, it's just as with biopsies, it's, it's a very, very small representation of a large organ. So, you know, there'll always be some in, in, inherent, you know, risks there in terms of the sampling. But, uh, you know, if, I think, you know, doing this in patient populations will allow us to get to, to get a, a glimpse of what's going on in the liver. So I, I think it's very promising. You know, I, I think already for, for immunology, it's, you know, there's quite a lot that can be done with, with, with the FNA, but I think also for the virology, it can be promising as well. Okay, thank you, B. So uh, what about you, Maya? Yes, How um... would you see the FNA in the, in the drug development process? So, so it, it is it is very challenging, Fabian, because we we don't know. I think that uh, we we would have to feel very comfortable already with what we can get with core biopsies prior to already start imagining how to interpret fine needle aspirates. Mm -hmm. So doing studies where you get both and then you compare, uh, it could be an, an option. Uh, we are definitely trying to collect as as many biopsies as we can, like everybody else, uh, but it's difficult and. Um, and I think that it's going to require probably a collective effort at some point, trying to see if we can all come together and interpret what we see, because it's going to be very difficult to get a lot of biopsies. Um, I, I think that we, we might want to consider still doing few core biopsies prior to just moving to, to finding the last bridge, because we might uh, actually uh, draw the wrong conclusions if we are not uh, being able to analyze tissue properly. Yeah, I think this is, um, uh, this is also the, uh, one of the assets of this uh, uh, network with, with ICHBV, that at some point we, we, we may have the opportunity to, to, um, to, to, to gather pe people, experts on, on, on on this question and try to um, to valorize uh, all this precious material, but core biopsies and, and FNAs to, to, to answer the uh, relevant questions as you were, were mentioning. Yeah. Um, so Anna Maria, what, what do you, what, since you, you asked so the question, so now what is it? Is <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, I mean, we obviously, as with everybody else, very keen to use fine needle aspirates um, or at least explore the feasibility of taking serial fine needle aspirates. I think that the advantage, obviously, besides the you know, not being as invasive as a liver biopsy, is the ability to repeat the sampling um, a few times in the course of a relatively short uh, study, um, which could provide you with prospective samples uh, to analyze from each patient. So that is definitely uh, interest and support um, for conducting such sub-studies. Um, and they are certainly part of plans. The challenges, if I may just uh, come back to your point about uh, the you know, uh, collaboration and integration. So what are the challenges is 
um, finding, uh, for example, enough uh, clinical trial centers that have developed uh, the expertise to, and I'm not saying that is beyond the ability of investigators, but there is, has to be a specific interest, identify a specific um, a team um, of a couple of people or so that take a specific interest in um, uh, setting up the technique for collection as well as for uh, immediate, uh, immediate storage or uh, immediate processing for immunology studies. So there are some operational challenges in identifying um, the sites where all of that is possible, where the clinical site that is recruiting the patient is also able to collect the serial, finding the last spirates at certain you know, times in the study. And also that there is a linkage immediately, for instance, uh, with uh, the ability to run the immunology on fresh samples. Those uh, and uh, the, the you know, ideal conditions then, for instance, if a, a certain amount of samples should be stored, the ideal conditions for storing that sample to enable, for example, future biology analysis have not been defined. So all of this creates operational challenges to actually really going after finding the, bio, um, uh, finding the last spirits big time within, within a study. Uh, there is still a lot to do in that sense, you know, to make it easier, not easy, easy, but at least a bit more feasible um, on, a, on a broader scale. So those are the, okay. the, the challenges that I, I see at the moment. Okay, th th thank you, Anna Maria. That's, uh, I mean, very good points. Now I want to ask to uh, Gavin, not not, now, not on the uh, drug development part, but on the uh, um, um, uh, on the aspect of validation of, of biomarkers or validation of assays. Um, what what you think uh, um, in is needed in terms of comparison with the liver compartment when you're assessing a novel uh, serum biomarker or, or validating uh, uh, a new assay, clinical uh, diagnostic assay? Well, I think obviously we need um, access to uh, the, the samples that, that from the same patient at the same time. So if it's possible or near time to get um, you know, biopsy, fine needle aspirate, and the blood compartment uh, fr from the same uh, period, then we'd be able to uh, look at um, how do the results uh, compare to each other. I think we, we have some experience with fine needle aspirate from the hep C space, and it worked quite well for uh, the, the um, virology uh, aspect of it. Uh, so we, I, I don't see, it, it's not something that we've done to date, just to, uh, to be transparent, but it's something that we could look into for the for the future with the uh, HPV biomarkers that we've, we've got going. But really, it's uh, it's the standard stuff you need is as to, to to draw the bridge between the different compartments uh, that you're testing and the clinical presentation, uh, the clinical picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, thank you, Gavin. Now, now a, a, a clinical question to to Henry. Uh, be, what, what, are, what, what do you see as challenges to do these, these studies? We all would like to have uh, the, uh, uh, really a detailed evaluation on, on all the different compartments, the uh, blood circulation and, and the liver. So, so uh, in pra practical and clinical terms, what, what are the challenges in your, in your mind? I must, I must say that um, not every site are comfortable with the FNA because it's the liver biopsy, everyone has been doing it for a long time. But definitely FNA, not every site is doing it. Although technically speaking, it should be easier and safer than liver biopsy, but it all depends on expertise of, of performing this assay. So I think this is one of the challenge that we might be, we, we may have some difficulty to get enough sites to participate in the sub-studies. After all, we know that most of these uh, studies are early phase studies, and uh, all investigators know that a phase one study is not going to induce functional cure in most of their patients. So all these uh, uh, invasive procedures are more for scientific um, value instead of for patients. So that will be another hurdle for investigators to join uh, in the sub-studies. So, so, um, uh, I think uh, in order to improve the recruitment rate, uh, one way is to, of course, find sites that are very experienced in that, and others is uh, there may there may be say some 
um, uh, training or demonstration of this type of skills for sites that are interested but not too com comfortable with these tech skills. After all, if the sites have experience in liver biopsy, I don't think FNA is a difficult thing to learn or acquire. Um, so that may also help to increase the number of sites interested in, this, uh, in, in doing the FNA sub studies. Okay, thank you, Henry. Um, so Mala, I Mala, please go, go um, ahead now. It's your turn. <laughs> bring it back to the serum. Um, there's an interesting discussion going on um, in the Q&A between Maurizio Brunetto and, and Dieter Gleiber talking about trying to pool some panels of sera from different, the heterogeneity of the different groups. Um, for example, people with um, pre-core mutants and, and just to do all the new state-of-the-art assays with the lowest possible threshold of detection with a really wide panel of patient samples, which seems like something which this consortium, this um, ISHBV, would be a really good place to try to coordinate. Um, does somebody, maybe Dieter, Dieter, do you want to start by commenting on that? Yes, I can. Uh, the question was, uh, okay, would be very good uh, to have some kind of uh, panel like the HPV genotype panel for the HPS antigen assay uh, and the um, HPV viral load determination. And to this was very successful um, in improving these assays. And uh, the idea was to uh, um, adopt this to the other assays, for example, uh, the new biomarkers for the messenger RNAs, you have to be, uh, you have to take care that you can get all genotypes with your assay. And this is sequence dependent, just to mention one point. And it would be good to have uh, um, the, main, um, the main genotypes and possibly some mutants uh, to cover this and to look for sensitivity. And this can can be, as I wrote in the in the uh, in the chat, um, this can be done by uh, people who have the sera, but sera are mainly limited. But one can use um, uh, clones in um, in cell culture and uh, to get this in vitro to test uh, or to provide sensitivity of the tests. That's my impression to this thing. You, you. This is Gavin, there's, there is one comment I, I make is that there is a WHO genotype panel that you can use that's kind of very broad, high level, and uh, evaluating new diagnostic tests across genotypes, diverse mutants, strains, uh, is standard practice in the uh, diagnostic development kind of world. So through, our, you know, for us, our global surveillance program has been at it for 26 years collecting these. So. That's one thing that, that, that we, we do uh, as a matter of routine. And in terms of mutations, you'd have to be obviously uh, selective of the mutations that might impact your diagnostic test, and not just looking at mutations that are nowhere near your target region that would kind of uh, be, a, be a bit futile. So you've got to be kind of selective in the mutations that you pick and, and pick them for a reason. So would most of the panel feel that this, this is already, there's already adequate panels of samples to cover this or that we could benefit from some more pooling of samples? Well, with one last point, I'm sorry to just jump in again, but there are also commercially available genotype panels and a lot of vendors that kind of, you know, make a living out of providing these things. Uh, what about, can I just ask about the, um, the different um, S antigen, distinguishing different S antigen and also distinguishing complexes of S and anti-S. Can anyone say anything about progress on those fronts? So, I, 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 not, I don't want to hug. Is it, is it okay if I chime in? This is Gavin again. So yeah. we have... Um, we have developed uh, isoform assays uh, for our high throughput platform, and we are kind of engaged in that research, the, or looking at that space. One element I think that um, always uh, struck me is if you look at the data um, 
you know, at the population level, it can be interesting. You can kind of see differences, but the the error bars are just so huge when you see the data, and even you know, we, we uh, our our own uh, that the it's kind of difficult. They overlap so much. If you had a person in front of you, I think I'd be hard pressed to think of making a a, a kind of a definitive. Uh, diagnosis or staging somebody based on the isoform data and um, as well as that you know when you see the data where these small medium and large and you see these kind of significant shifts in the large and medium but not so much in the small or, or total they're on such orders of magnitude that a smaller change you know they, they could be changing at kind of a relatively equivalent amount uh, but you won't see it in the in the small because it's just there in such an, a, a vast amount that you, it won't really make it that much of a dent um, in your in your trend lines uh, just a, a point to be aware of when you're looking at that data um, I, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Lovely, thank you. I think before we run out of time, Fabian, is it all right if we just turn back to Patricia Fauci? Because um, there's a question asking about sort of what take home messages can you give for the monitoring of HCC to the patient community, given the sort of limitations that you discussed? Very important question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So thank you for the question. I think it's important, uh, the translation in the clinical practice. And uh, I think uh, from uh, my talk, I, would, I think one of the most important message uh, as a clinician is that uh, regarding the alpha fetoprotein, I think it is remain the most important biomarker so far. Although we know there are some limitations but also how we are using this biomarker, I think is very important because it's very difficult to make a clinical judgment or diagnosis based on only one determination. So I believe that the serial determination in a longitudinal follow-up may help a lot to interpret the clinical uh, significance even of minimal changes in the alpha phytoprotein level. So I think that this is an important step as a clinician to look for. And there are also other, other uh, papers that have shown very clearly that, especially during treatment, uh, when you have minimal hepatic inflammation, it's very important to see the cutoff of the alpha fetoprotein. So I think it's very important to tailor the cutoff according to the healthy levels and to the activity of the disease, because in patients that are immunosuppressed, as well as in HCV, maybe there is a risk, but it's minimal, so it's very important to see minimal changes. Now, regarding the use of alpha fetoprotein alone, of course, there is no debate, it's not enough. It should be associated with uh, other biomarkers. And so far, uh, based on the data, uh, the most promising panel is the three biomarkers that are alpha fetoprotein, AFPL3, and DCP. Also because we know that there are some patients that do not produce uh, alpha fetoprotein although it's difficult uh, to quantify completely which is the rate of this patient because can fluctuate the uh, sensitivity and so on. And then I think another message that take home is the fact that probably so far, the most important data have been obtained by the GALAG score, which includes in addition to the three biomarkers, also some clinical parameters like gender and age. So I believe that uh, this, uh, the message is that uh, we need to look at uh, serial determination and also, if possible, to combine uh, more than one biomarkers. And uh, for sure, uh, if uh, I would continue to do the ultrasound, although there is a lot of variability. So we need to keep in mind that the ultrasound done in some center is not exactly sensitive as the one done in another center. And we know. So we need also to be aware of the possibility because uh, uh, of the center where we are, we are working, because it is pretty clear that uh, 
from the data present in the literature that the ultrasound varies from 21% to 89%. So this tells us that it is not possible to use only ultrasound. This is for sure. So my message is to combine uh, these uh, three um, possibility, the three biomarkers and uh, for sure the ultrasound. Okay. Because, you know, also for another reason, because the cost of effectiveness of this uh, probably is less than once a patient develops a tumor and there is no more uh, treatment. That's also, I mean, considering the... Okay. Thank you. Uh, Fabian, any final questions, or we should hand back to Anna? Maybe one one final and quick question, maybe to to Mara, who, who didn't have a chance to uh, to to have questions um, after our talk. So so uh, Maura, if you're still still here, um, so with, with your um, uh, experience uh, with your um, the work done on on uh, the uh, liver humanized mice. Um, what, what do you see, I mean, uh, as a most promising biomarker for, for uh, HBV elimination for, for, for animal studies um, for in, 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 your, in your mouse system? So, uh, not in humans, but do you think that correlated antigen and, and HBV RNA in, in, in serum are, are, are valid markers or should, should they be improved for, for these re research purposes? Well, thank you, Fabienne. I think in, uh, we have the data for the S antigen, of course, even if we have not yet much data about uh, the, how also with Elaine was the same, the contribution from integration that we know we also have, and uh, the cDNA was still an open issue. But related core antigen, I think we need to study more um, to have more data, especially for threshold of uh, uh, detection, which of course, if are very, a lot of replication is there, but you know, how fine is this kind of uh, scale? Um, and so far, the maybe more, data we are accumulating are quite interesting up here is the really on the pregenomic RNA in serum. Um, so I think they are quite confident that um, with available methods and improving methods, uh, standardizing this method, it might be quite useful marker because it seems that most of these uh, signals are coming from the CCC DNA. So I think to to study the impact of therapy, it's very good, but of course it depends on the mode of action of the drug. Um, because if we are talking about immune system, of course, then we are not that good yet, <laughs> definitely. Um, but a direct antiviral, I think it's a good way to really to study, to assess uh, how, is, how different therapy are working. But again, the, the great advantage I think is we have the liver. So we can look really what in the hepatocytes, in the human hepatocytes going on and, do, and try to do this type of correlation, but still it's a model. So we have okay. something, right? Okay, I so think we can work on, on that quite a lot, but depend on the question. Uh, thank you, Mala. Thank you. So, so, so Mala, I think we, we uh, uh, I hand over to you, I think, to conclude, I think. Well, 